Okay, today, before we start, today I've noticed that um, people have brought Vajugini statues and uh, Tara statues and Guru Rinpoche and Kuan Yin and many types of pendants and that's very, very good. So what I want to remind the people with tantric empowerments, uh, especially those with tantric empowerment, higher tantric empowerments, especially who are doing the talk, is a wonderful time to consecrate the statues. People think that, oh, um, if we have statues, high lamas and geshis and monks should bless them. Yes, that would be wonderful if high lamas, geshis and um, monks bless them. But at the same time, what I want people to realize is the blessing words and in invocation and meditation is the same for whether you're a high lama or you're an ordinary person. So the words are exactly the same and the object that we're asking to come forth to bless these are exactly the same. So the object that we're asking to come forth is the three jewels, which is the Buddha, all the Buddhas, the Dharmas and Sangha, to come forth and dissolve and to bless those objects. So therefore, um, whether we recite or a high lama recites, the liturgy is exactly the same. The meditation is exactly the same. And also um, the deities or the Buddhas that we're invoking is exactly the same. So therefore, uh, there's no difference from the side of the Buddhas. If we invoke the Buddhas to come forth and bless the holy objects, they will not come forth and bless it if you're a high lama, and then if you're not a high lama, they won't come forth. That's absolutely illogical. So um, from their side, they're totally compassionate, and they act upon request. So therefore, it's a very good time to bring our pendants, to bring our malas, to bring our holy objects, to bring our example, our um, Buddha images, big or small, during talk time, to place in front to get them consecrated. It's a very, very wonderful time. And what I want to start in Malaysia is, I want to start the tradition is not have people become Lama or Rinpoche dependent. Lama and Rinpoche dependent meaning that only a Rinpoche, only a Lama, only a Geshe, only a monk can bless these items. So I want people to get off that dependency. Why? Because it's not true. As simple as that, it's not true. So therefore, if we ourselves generate loving, compassionate mind, and a wish that whoever sees these deities, whoever sees these holy images and wears these holy pendants will be blessed, then with this kind of loving mind, then we invoke upon the Buddhas and we ask them to come forth and we ask them to bless it, then it will be very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. So similarly like that, high lamas basically do that. High lamas generate a loving, compassionate mind. They invoke the three jewels to come forth and dissolve into the, into the statues. So what happens is the statues are what we call samaya beings. Samaya beings. The beings that we invoke, the actual Buddhas are called wisdom beings. A wisdom being can abide and can exist without a Samaya being, but that is only perceivable by another wisdom being. So therefore, if you're highly attained or you have a third level path of seeing, then you're able to see the Buddhas. If you are not at the path of seeing, if you are not highly attained, then it's very, very difficult for us to see the Buddhas. So therefore, if we have a Samaya being, which is a statue or a pendant or a tanka or a picture, those are beings who represent the Buddha or represent an enlightened being. I want everybody to understand that we don't pray to a statue or to a picture or to a pendant or to a wood or gold or brass image. We don't pray to that. What we're praying to is an enlightened being. But because we are not enlightened, it's very, very difficult to see these beings directly, to perceive these beings directly, to be able to hold the meditation directly. So therefore, in aid to our meditation, in aid to our tantric practice, in aid to our daily prayers, we have beautiful statues, we have beautiful images and pendants and whatnot. Actually, those who have supreme refuge, 
and they hold their refuge vows very well. They hold their commitments very well. They don't need pendants. They don't need. Example, when we go to the monastery, actually protective pen pendants and protective strings and all that is not allowed. According to the monk vows, it's not, it's, not a, it's not an infracture, but it's not allowed. Why? If you've taken refuge, you'll be protected from all different types of harm. But it's for ordinary people like you and me, whose refuge is not very strong, whose confidence is not very strong, and whose practice is not very strong. For those of us that confidence and refuge is not very strong, then pendants and amulets and, and different types of protections are very, very helpful. So therefore, I want you all to understand is that we are not praying to the pendants. We're not praying to the statues or the stupas. We're not praying to the images. We're not praying to the tankas and pictures. We are praying to what they represent. We are praying to their symbolism and we are praying to their potential. So therefore you're saying, well, why do we need them at all? Again, let me repeat. The reason we need them is our meditation is not very strong. Our focus and our concentration is not very strong. So sometimes we cannot visualize well, we cannot think well, we cannot focus very well. So having images and statues and pendants and tankas is very, very helpful as a visual aid. Having said that it's a visual aid, it's helpful, do not leave it simply as a visual aid. Also, these images are very highly blessed and powerful. Why? Because they are in the image of an enlightened being. That lineage of having images of enlightened being didn't come from Tibet. That one came from Lord Buddha himself. That image. Where the king of Sri Lanka wished to see the Buddha very much, didn't have the opportunity to see him. So Buddha had a line drawing made of his, whole, of his own body and that was shipped to the king of Sri Lanka to worship. From that started the tradition. The Buddha doesn't have an ego, but Buddha knows that a Buddha's form or a Buddha's physical appearance has tremendous benefit for sentient beings that they look upon it. Many, many benefits, which I won't get into tonight. So the tradition of making images of holy beings didn't start from Tibet. It didn't start from uh, China. It didn't start from some um, Korea or Japan or religious tradition. It started from Lord Buddha himself. So therefore, having holy images is a tradition that came from Lord Buddha himself. So anything having to do with holy images, making them, painting them, having them, making offerings to them, wearing them, is very, very beneficial. So when we have a Samaya being, a Samaya being is those images that represent the enlightened being. Those images that represent the enlightened being are Samaya beings. And actually, because they're in the form of an enlightened being, they're already highly blessed. When I was uh, attending to His Holiness Kebja Saramchi in Los Angeles, I was in his room and one uh, Tibetan man came in and he brought a small Tara pendant for Kebja Saramchi to bless. And I remember very clearly he offered up to Saramchi and asked him to bless it because he wants to wear it. And Saramchi, in his very direct, usual, curt manner, said, I don't need to bless Tara. Since it's an image of Tara, it is already blessed. It's highly blessed because it's an image of her. So I don't need to bless. So the man insisted. So Rimichi said, all right, to make you happy, I'll do the uh, rituals that you like. And that's what Rimichi said himself. So I quote from Buddha and I quote from Kedja Saramchi, which is infallible. So therefore, when we have beautiful images, beautiful pendants, beautiful statues, beautiful pictures, and they're made well, and they're made, and they're bought from money that is clean, meaning, oh, we didn't go and rob people, and we didn't go kill people, and we didn't, um, 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 how to say, uh, sell alcohol to get the money to do this. But we actually, 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 from good, clean sources, Good, clean sources we acquire these items so when we acquire these items they're very precious they're beautiful to look at they're pre very precious to have and how we treat these items how we treat these items is how much blessing and potential we will have 
if we treat an, an image of the enlightened being, the Buddhas or the Bodhisattvas, if we treat them as if they are alive, as if they are real, as if they are present, we will get the benefit of them. High beings in the past. High beings doesn't mean high lamas. It doesn't mean males. It means beings. High meaning good motivation. In the past, there are many instances of Lama Tsongkhapa statues, Tara statues, Shakyamuni statues actually speaking, sometimes moving. In India, in exile, there are many, many monasteries which still house statues that have spoken many times on many occasions. Very, very famous. For example, in South India, there's this monastery called Tsongkhar Chode, and they have a beautiful sandalwood, white sandalwood Tara that has spoken on many occasions. It is so precious that they have built a special chapel for her and they have caged it in, meaning they have special grills and all that to protect this image. It's not only an antique, which is not the value to Tibetans, but it has spoken many, many times on many occasions. And there are statues in North India of Vajogini that before a disaster will happen, before a disaster, the image will shed tears. And you see, what's the point? The point is people can do, have preparation. People can do pujas, people can do prayers to avert. So usually this image of Vajogini in North India, I have a picture of it, will shed tears before anything happens. So images that speak, images that show positive or very clear signs is not dependent on an outer factor. From the, from the three jewel side, from the Buddha side, all is exactly the same. All images are exactly the same. But from the side of the practitioner, from the side of the person who has confidence and faith, if they have a good motivation and they treat the images always clean and well and with respect and also make offerings and treat the images as if they were really living beings, then the images become real living beings. The Buddha himself said, making an offering to an image of me, a likeness, that's the word, of me or to me, the merits are exactly the same. So whether we make offerings to a likeness of Lord Buddha or to him directly, the merits is exactly the same. There's no difference. Why? Enlightened mind, enlightened energy cannot be stopped by time, space, and physical obstruction. Meaning if the Buddha is in India and you're here, you make offerings, you cannot, make, uh, cannot get benefits, impossible. Impossible. So therefore, even people, even people who are non-Buddhists, which is fine, Buddhism never says everyone has to be Buddhist. That's incorrect. For us to think that everyone must be Buddhist, that's incorrect. Everyone has their own path, everyone has their own method, and everyone has their wonderful technique to reach a higher level in their mind. The state of God or the state of Buddha, whatever we like to call it. So all religion is fine, but my point is an enlightened being, even those who do not know of its benefits, when they see an enlightened being's form, it will benefit that person. It will bless that person. That is by the power of not the observer or the perceiver, but that is by the power of the object. Example, if, I, if you need to have an example of that, whether you are 15, whether you are 10, whether you are 5, whether you are 40, or whether you are 100 years old, whether you are 80 years old, gold has intrinsic value to these people, to people. So if you give solid gold to a young child, the gold is not devalued because the child doesn't know the value of the gold. If you give the gold to a person who knows the value, also it doesn't become more or doesn't become less. So the gold itself has value from its own side. Therefore, since gold has value from its own side, whether the perceiver or the receiver realizes the value of the gold or not, it doesn't matter. The gold, the value of the gold does not go down. Similarly, an enlightened being, an enlightened being cannot be devalued or less benefit or more benefit by the person who perceives. But the person who perceives, who understands the value of an enlightened being, an enlightened image such as the Buddha image, it makes a difference for them because they will be able to do more things in relations to it, such as making offerings, prostrations, mandala offerings, uh, aspirational prayers, flowers, whatever. But even those who do not know the value or the intrinsic value of an enlightened being, seeing that enlightened being still confers mental, karmic dispositions to become an enlightened being in the future. So therefore, knowing the value of an enlightened being or not knowing still has benefits. Still has benefits. So therefore, when we have a Buddha image, when we have a Buddha statue, when we have tankas, 
We don't pray. Let me repeat. We don't pray to the statues. They're made of metal and wood and gold and silver and brass and copper. We don't pray to the images. We don't pray to the pictures. We don't pray to the tankas. We don't pray to any of those. We have those images as a symbolic representation of a state that we can achieve. And if our meditation is advanced, and our awareness and concentration is advanced, we don't need any images. Very high beings who go into meditation, who go into retreat, I've noticed many of them, they have next to no images. So we say, oh, I want to be like them, but we are not like them. If we want to be like them by not having images, then we should be like them by holding our vows, doing our commitments, pushing ourselves, and thinking, having loving compassion, gaining attainments. So if we want to be like them, we cannot be like them selectively. So therefore, that's not a valid excuse. As His Holiness, the great 13 Dalai Lama has said during his Molam prayers, which I've read, he gives Molam teachings every year, His Holiness. The 13 Dalai Lama, just like His Holiness, the 14 Dalai Lama. But I read in the teachings of the 13 Dalai Lama that for lay people, those without much vows, and commitments for lay people the best source of of collecting merits is an elaborate and beautiful altar and in fact not having an elaborate and beautiful altar to the best of one's financial means is a sign of one's lack of spiritual commitment that's what his holiness says so therefore one's altar and how we take care of it and how elaborate and how beautiful it is and how clean and how much care we put towards it shows our spiritual conviction and for lay people, it's the best source of making merit, if not one of the few sources of making merit. So therefore, His Holiness the 13 Dalai Lama rec um, recommends very much for us to have a beautiful altar, elaborate, clean, offerings done very well, which is a very source of merit for all of us. If we think about it every day, if we think and contemplate every single day, from the time we wake up at, in the morning or whenever we wake up to the time we go to sleep, what do we actually do that's really Dharma? or that transforms our mind or collects merit. Most of the time we're eating, or preparing to eat, or preparing food to eat, or cleaning up after we have eaten. Eating is a very big production for most of us. That's why restaurants are very, very popular around here. Eating is a very big preoccupation. But that's kind of like animals. Animals work very hard to get food. Animals fodder all day along for food. It's not so much different. And what's the next thing we like to do? We like to talk. We like to talk about this, we like to talk about that, we like to give our opinions about this, we like to recollect the past, we like to recollect uh, the present, we like to talk about the future, we like to talk and talk and talk, and most of our day is given away to talk time and given away to eating time. Then, very little activity is given towards spiritual attainment. I'm not saying people are bad, I'm not saying people are, uh, are evil or negative, that's not the point. The point is to reflect carefully what we actually do with our lives and how much merit we actually collect, and how much change do we actually um, um, incur or, or create in our minds. So therefore, when we have a holy image, we are not praying to them. They are reminders. When we offer jewelry on them, it is offering how to offer jewelry on a visualized being. When we offer clothes and brocades on them or offering lights, it's very difficult for ordinary people like me and you to visualize and offer. In tantric practice, you can. In tantric practice, you can definitely offer everything that's visualized. In fact, it's more elaborate and more uh, very, very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. But for ordinary beings like myself, it's very difficult to do those offerings well. So therefore, I run the risk of wasting another day of not being able to collect any merits for my future, this life and future lives. I run that risk. Simply to do our sadhanas very dry, simply to do our prayers and our recitations very dry, with no offerings, with no preparation, with no awareness, with no cleanliness, then it's very, very, very dry. Very, very dry. Why? The very objects of our sadhana, one is offering. So therefore, offering is very important. And, kind of see what We have a lot of energy and time to prepare food for ourselves, to SMS food in my case, to throw a BF about not getting the food I want in my case. Also in preparing and shopping for and cleaning and cooking. We have a lot of time for that. But to put one glass of water in front of the Lord Buddha, we will give people lots of explanations on how much time we don't have or how exhausted we are or how we are pressured. But if it's a dinner for ourselves, 
we will drive to the restaurant, we will dress, we'll get our hair done. No problem to have a din din. And to prepare a nice din din at home, no problem at all. Lots of work if you think about it. Don't just think about the moment you eat. Even if we're, if we're sitting around like kings and queens being served by other people, it's still a lot of work because a lot of other people got to do a lot of other work for you. A lot of preparation for you. A lot of shopping, a lot of cooking, a lot of cleaning, and a lot of energy just to drive around, just to get food for you. And what do we have to return back to them? A cheap little thank you? No. Making offerings and dedicating for other people is very, very powerful. So making offerings to what? To the wall, to the sky, to the floor, to our men mentally visualized deities that we can't even visualize well. I've had some monks in the past, these are monks that are very new, ask me uh, what Tara looks like. So how to visualize? Can you imagine? I don't think anybody in this room doesn't, okay, maybe two or three, doesn't know what Tara is or who Tara is. So therefore having holy images is not to decorate the house. It is not to worship metal. It is not to pray to graven images. No, Buddhism does not believe in idolatry. Does not. Why? It has no intrinsic value. But knowing their representation or they're molded upon something that's very holy, then that's very different. Example, in other religions, the word of God is written in the Holy Quran or in the Holy Bible. And people hold that book very well. But if you look at the book very well, it's just paper and parchment and leather and plastic and ink. That's all it is. It's just paper. It's plastic. Or it's leather made from trees and made from ink or whatever. That's all the Bible and Quran is. But what's holy is not the paper and the ink. It is what is written. And it is how it changes people's minds. So when we worship and we pay respect to the Quran or the Bible. And in Buddhism, the Lamrim, it is not the paper. It is not the statue. So people think, oh, in Buddhism you have a lot of statues. No. It's the same meaning as in other religions. We don't worship the Quran. We don't worship the paper it's made on or the ink. We worship the meaning, the great meaning that it has. And that's the beautiful part. In the Holy Torah, in the Holy Lamrim books of Tibet, uh, of Buddhism, all these things, we don't worship the paper and the ink, but we respect and hold deep in our hearts the Word of God, the Word of an enlightened being. So you think about it. So having statues is equivalent to having paper and hold paper and a Bible, and you put the Bible up very high. You put up the Bible very, very high. So when people have crucifixes in churches, when people have crucifixes inside the church, that's the same as having a statue. They say, oh, you shouldn't worship idols. But a, but a cross is an idol. Because a cross itself is not God. The cross represents something holy. It represents a trinity. So when you go to the beautiful Hindu temples, like I went to Batu Caves recently, and you see the beautiful images there. The Hindu people there are not praying to the idols. They're not praying to the statues. They're not praying to those things made of stone. They're praying to what they represent. And that's the beauty of it. So in a, in a, in a beautiful Islamic religion, people don't go to the mosque to pray to the wall. But it's, a, it's an edifice of beauty made to honor God that one's devotion to God, to make the edifice or the building as beautiful as possible to honor something holy. So people don't go and worship the building. And then when they keep the Quran in a very clean and beautiful place, it is not the paper, it is not the ink, but it is the, is the meaning that is represented in that holy book. Same as in a church, same as in a temple. So just in temples, we go next step we actually make more images of enlightened beings. So therefore, all religions have the same purpose. All religious doctrines have the same purpose. And that's why I like His Holiness the Dalai Lama's stance and method and mode where he has interfaith surfaces around the world with people of all faiths together, all the time. 
where people can gather in one room, whether it's a mosque, a temple, or a church, it doesn't really matter, and pray their own way. Everybody here is not Buddhist. Everybody here should not be Buddhist. And everybody here who's not Buddhist is not lower or higher. But you need to find your own way. Your method. So as Buddhists, we have a responsibility to understand our religion very well. We have a responsibility to, to, to understand and study and know our religion very well so we can be better Buddhists. And when we are better Buddhists, we can respect the other religions even better. A real Buddhist does no harm to others and oneself. A fake Buddhist does harm. They criticize other religions, other people. That's a fake Buddhist. So a real Buddhist contributes to society by not making trouble, by understanding their faith well, and also when they understand their faith very well, they contribute to society. In a multi-plural, beautiful nation like Malaysia, where there are so many faiths and so many races and people, the reason why everybody can get along together so well is because people have a superficial understanding of each other's faith. The Muslims here see Chinese weddings, Buddhist weddings, Hindu weddings, Christian weddings, vice versa. And so they understand. They understand. Even sometimes you see a Hindu funeral. If you see a Hindu funeral, you see the body of the person who has passed away going past your house. I see the Muslims, the Malay people, the beautiful Malay people, the Chinese. Everybody show a deep respect. And that's what's beautiful about this place. And so as Buddhists, my special mission is to give more knowledge to Buddhists. Not to make more Buddhists. Not to convert. No, definitely not. If you have a good mother and father, if you have a good mother and father, why change their mother and father to a new mother and father? Why? If someone has a good mother and father. So the purpose of Buddhist practice is not to make people more Buddhist. The purpose of Buddhist practice is to make people understand their own religion very well. And when they understand their religion very well, they become a productive, happy, less depressed member of society. So how can we contribute to the country we live in by being good Buddhists? By not being a burden to others, by not being difficult. So that's very, very important. And that is the reason why we study Buddhism. That is why. So today, uh, we have brought some holy images, the representations of different Buddhas in pendant form and in statue form and of different traditions, Chinese and Tibetan predominantly here. And... Uh, those will be consecrated and blessed during Tzok. So during Tzok, there's a liturgy where we actually invite the holy beings forth and we ask them to enter. We ask them, you think, well, there are so many of them, which one do they enter? <laughs> I know some people will think that. There are so many images and there's one Buddha, which one can enter? No problem. The Buddha has what we call an emanation body. He can emanate in thousands and thousands and trillions and billions of forms simultaneously. So even if you have 20 statues, whether they're big or small, they go into him. They, from him or from her, they go in and they bless. So if your image is this small, trust me, a big fat Buddha like Zambala can still fit. So just think if, if the Buddhas look like Koki, and then you have an image of Koki, how to fit. And that's very different. Buddhas that are very fat and big, they can emanate very minute and tiny to bless. Then you think, oh, what about a slim, beautiful Buddha like Tara, who's very shapely and looked like a supermodel, and then you have a huge statue of her, how to have her fit inside, no problem at all. She can expand. So don't think, and don't think, oh, well, there's, there's 20 images there, which one gets the bigger blessing? If you can think that way, you already have, have wrong view about the Buddha's compassion and power. Buddha's compassion and power is equal equanimity. So whether the image is poorly made, whether the image is big or small or expensive or not, when you ask Lord Buddha or a Buddha to bless the image, to consecrate, the blessing will be equivalent. Equivalent. Okay? So that's very, very important to know. So doing so, so for, we should let people know, people who wish to have con uh, their pendants or malas or their statues or whatever, consecrated. Tok is a very, very good time. 
And sometimes if we have big images, we can set an extra table here on the left or right on the front to put the images there. And doing so, those people who have tantric empowerment, those are the ones with the tables, those ones with tantric empowerment should develop a good motivation and think, may these people who have these images, who see them, who wear them, who touch them, who have anything to do with them, be completely blessed and be completely protected and have long life and happiness. All right?